went to Walmart and that's all they had for candles and looks. It was the Mexican things, you know, all the Catholic stuff. Good evening, church. Welcome. We're going to start a little bit different tonight because we're going to start with an Advent wreath. Uh, if you will, please, you know, follow along. Last week, we talked about the promise that was given in Isaiah 14 of the birth of Jesus. And so we're lighting the candles to, to symbolize the promise that was given to us. And this week, we're talking about the love and faith of Mary and her willingness to submit herself to God and His plan. And so this is a candle for faith. Let us bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank You. We rejoice in You. We worship You as we gather here this evening. And we ask that Your presence would surround us that as we talk about Mary and as we sing together and celebrate your goodness and your kindness, be near to us. Show us your loving kindness. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. My songs aren't there. Hold on. No problem. Something didn't load right. We do apologize, but something didn't load right, so we got to reload it.
apologize for the delay. We had some technical difficulties with the PowerPoint, and we're ready to go again. So let's join together in song.
Okay, church, we're going to take a few moments and pray together. Lots of things happening in our world uh, that we want to pray for our leaders for sure. And also we want to make sure we pray for friends and neighbors who are troubled. And uh, we, do have, we do have a friend that is uh, seriously ill right now. And we want to make sure we mention the fact that we are praying for them to recover. Uh, we have people that are struggling in many, many ways, more ways than we can imagine. And we want to take the time. Where'd my Bible go? To uh, lift all these things up in prayer. Got some things misplaced here tonight. <laughs> it's okay. All will work out in the end. So let's bow our heads for prayer. God our Father, we thank you. We rejoice in you that we have the freedom to worship. The opportunity to share your grace and your goodness, to, to study and to learn from your from your word. Jesus, we do praise you and we do thank you. We worship before you and ask that your presence would guide us now as we study from your word, that you would put in our hearts a serious concern for, for our nation, for our leaders, for our county supervisors and our governor and our legislators and our Congress people and our senators, and especially for the President of the United States. Lord, there's so much confusion and there's so much trouble and there's so much turmoil right now. And we ask that your peace that passes all understanding would come down upon us. And Lord, we do repent sincerely, seriously. We are a nation that is unclean. We kill our babies, uh, we riot in the streets, we murder people because we disagree with them. We simply cancel people and stop having relationships with them. These things do not honor you, Lord. And we pray that by the power of your grace and the fullness of the presence of your Holy Spirit, that we would be forgiven and cleansed and washed. Lord, earnestly we ask that your presence would be with some friends that we know are ill and troubled and struggling to regain health. Bless them, Jesus. Touch them. You know who they are. You know who we're praying for. And we ask that your fullness and your power and your presence would come down on them. And Lord, there are people that are sick and the hospital is full of people that have a virus uh, and they are tragically ill, ill enough to require hospitalization. And we do pray that in the fullness of the measure of your Holy Spirit, that you would touch them and raise them up, that you would drive this thing out of our nation, that you would cause us to rise up and rejoice in you and to experience your grace and your knowledge. Protect us, Jesus. Fill us with a sense of wonder and awe that this Christmas, it might be about you not about us, not about the presence, not about our nation, but about you. You came and we celebrate your birth because you are our salvation, our hope, God in the flesh. Lord, we worship you and we ask that you would be present with us as we study together. Give us your grace this day. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to take a look at Luke 1 and uh, verses 26 through 38. If you would like to grab your Bible, please grab it, open it to Luke chapter 1 and read along with me. Uh, too many verses to put up on PowerPoint slides. Uh, we had enough difficulty with just getting it up and going tonight. <laughs> For some reason, it didn't save properly, and we apologize for that, but uh, let's, let's take a look at these verses, starting with verse 26 of Luke's Gospel. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel 
was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph, of the descendants of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And coming in, he said to her, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was very perplexed at this statement and kept pondering what kind of salutation this was. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come down upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for this reason the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. And behold, even your relative Elizabeth has also conceived a son in her old age, and she who was called barren is now in her sixth month, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold the bond slave of the Lord, may it be done to me according to your word. And the angel departed her. You know, we're going to take a look at angels first of all tonight. But I want to make note of the fact that our world is really, really deeply troubled right now. There are people out there that are saying, I'm not even going to bother de decorating for Christmas. They're, they're broken hearted. They're disappointed. They're, they're broken down. The Bible tells us that Jesus came at the right time to bring salvation to all of the people. And the truth is, the right time was was a time that was full of all kinds of trouble, all kinds of tribulation, all kinds of difficulty. King Herod was a vicious and wicked ruler. Uh, the Caesars who ran Rome and dictated what Herod could and could not do and sent the Roman army into, into Israel were crucifying people left and right. It was a troubled time, a time where there wasn't much hope, where there wasn't much to look forward to. And I want to say, you know, you can, you can see the candles, you, you know, you can see the tree, at least part of it. Uh, there's decorations all over the house. We decorated for Christmas, not because we want our house to be pretty, not because we want the decorations, but because we want to honor Jesus. We want to make him the center of our worship and of our home. And we want to celebrate the power and the wonder of his birth. And so, yeah. We drug out our decorations. And yes, it's a lot of work. But this passage starts with something that might be a bit scary for most of us, the angel Gabriel. You see, angels aren't the cute, roly-poly cherub babies that are naked and, uh, or beautiful women that are, that are partly clothed like the painters of, of the Renaissance painted, like Da Vinci and Michelangelo and Raphael painted. It's just not the way angels are. The Bible s says nothing of cherubs being babies, nothing of ch angels being women. In fact, there is not a female angel named in all of Scripture. It just doesn't happen. They're not beautiful women. Uh, they don't have wings like the, like the mural that you're seeing there on the screen. And I'm going to show you that mural just right now. See, uh, it, it, it's, called a, it's called actually the style that it's in is, is called uh, a French ribbon. And, and so the ribbon starts up in the upper left and spreads down and picks up the white in the woman that is picking up flowers and back up into the white of the person walking and up into the white of the uh, of the woman on the seat of the wagon and the wagon itself and and if we go to the left side of the picture 
this is actually a huge mural. It's it's 14 feet long, high, and 40 feet wide. It's, it's enormous. It sits in the uh, top of the main stair grand staircase in the state capitol in Des Moines, Iowa, and it's a beautiful it's a beautiful picture. But here are these women made to look like they're angels with their clothes and their robes and their capes flowing up and back behind like, like they're angels. And it's called Westward. And it's about the westward migration of, of people. And so this half of the painting shows the, the women and shows the uh, angels and shows the wagon and it, and it shows the pioneers entering Iowa. But the other half, there's the left half, shows the later pioneers who came, the later people who arrived, and, and the Industrial Revolution. In fact, if you go back to that first picture, uh, the woman holding the book is holding education, enlightenment. Uh, the woman holding a shield is holding the shield of the state of Iowa. The woman holding a basket is holding seed corn to, to sow and plant in the ground. But when you go to the other half of the picture, there's a steam engine in the hand of the one angel, and then there's an electric power generator in the hand of the other angel. And, and what I find odd about this, and then, then there's, of course, crops to be harvested and, and people, workers coming in, laborers to come to the state, and, and it tells of the progress you know, of, of pioneering and of settling and of harvesting the land from a wild prairie. Wonderful. Just one problem. The people who settled Iowa came as religious sufferers who were trying to get away from governments that were ruling over them and telling them where and how they could worship and they wanted the freedom of religion. They wanted freedom of worship. And there is nothing in here of Christ, nothing in here of the church, nothing in here of the power of God to deliver people out of bondage and into the freedom of light to worship and serve Him. And while it's a powerful painting, and it's a famous painting, and a beautiful painting, it's a wrong painting. It doesn't say what really needs to be said about the way that the state of Iowa was settled. So Luke 1 starts out talking about Gabriel. And truthfully, uh, we, have to, we have to take a look at Gabriel because Michael the archangel and Gabriel, who stood in the presence of God, that's what he said about himself in, in the first part of Luke 1, are the only two angels in all of Scripture that are given names. They're the only ones. They're, they're, there are no other angels named. The Bible does talk about... Uh, holy angels as the heavenly hosts, not, not evil angels, but holy angels as the heavenly hosts, that is the army of God. Uh, it talks about them being cherubim. It talks about them being seraphim. It talks about them living, uh, being living beings. And nowhere, never, ever are they feminine, ever, nowhere. Anything more about angels is baloney. Simply said, there's a whole list. If you look it up online, you'll find that there are uh, a whole list of archangels. Bible doesn't say anything about that list. That list is mostly made up. It comes out of the book of Enoch, and the book of Enoch is not a part of the scriptures in the Bible. And yes, some people believe them, and yes, some people think that they're correct, and some people follow them. And, and some of what we see in, in the paintings of angels is really from the book of Enoch, not from the Bible. Not to mention the fact that the painters weren't really religious people. They were just workers who had skill and were paid by the uh, church to paint pictures of scenes that they wanted painted and put up in the churches. You see, angels as cherubs, angels as women, are really put into our sight and put into our world by by mystics, by romantics, by artists who painted the phony Bible pictures that they painted. And these, these things 
have a powerful visual image, but they aren't true. And so when we look at Luke 1, we see Gabriel, and Gabriel is truly, truly one of the most powerful angels. He, he really is. Uh, he only appears in Scripture four places, once in Daniel 8, once in Daniel 9, scared the living bejeebers out of Daniel, terrified him. He fell on his face and shook like a dead man because Gabriel was a holy, holy being, and Daniel realized he stood in the presence of something very, very holy without being himself clean. Gabriel appeared in Luke 1, in the first part of Luke 1, when he appeared to Zacharias, John the Baptist's father, in the temple. And again, John the Baptist's father, Zacharias, was terrified. He was totally shaken in his being and left without the ability to speak for nine full months after that event, that encounter. That's Gabriel. Man, he's a scary dude. Uh, we don't know how big he is. We're, we don't know how big he appears. We know in these places he appeared as though he was a man. And we know that in Daniel, Daniel, he appeared to Daniel after Daniel had fasted and prayed for 21 days. 21 days. And he said that he had been fighting with the angel of the prince of, or the fallen angel, the prince of Persia, the demon of the prince of Persia, for those 21 days. And, he, and Daniel said, that Gabriel appeared to be exhausted. We don't, we don't think of angels as ever being tired, but in this particular case, Gabriel was exhausted. And then we come to Mary, and it says in the sixth month, and that's re in reference to Elizabeth's pregnancy in the, in the previous passage, when, when Elizabeth was six months along with John the Baptist, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth. Nazareth, And Gabriel showed up in Nazareth, just kind of dropped in on Mary sometime around March of 4 or 5 BC. Now, how do I know that? Well, because we know that King Herod died April 4th of 4 BC. And Jesus had to be born before Herod died. Now, obviously, it probably wasn't in 4 BC. It was probably a year earlier in 5 BC that Gabriel made that appearance. But why do we know it was in March? Because Zacharias was in the temple offering sacrifices and offering incense, burning incense before the presence of God on the Ark of the Covenant on the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement comes somewhere near the end of September, 1st of October. When his week was finished, he went home. Elizabeth became pregnant, and six months later, Gabriel appeared to Mary. That makes it somewhere around March. And that means that Jesus, yes, indeed, he was probably born sometime in December. We can deduce that from the things that were factually told about, about this angel and about Mary and about his timing. Take a close look at the message that Gabriel gave to Mary. There's a whole list of things here uh, that, that we want to run through and we want to talk about because they are powerful. They literally are powerful. He told Mary she will conceive and have a son and name him Jesus. I mean, wait a minute. Here's Mary, she's in the house. She's maybe sweeping the floor, maybe doing laundry, maybe she's preparing food for dinner. We, you know, maybe she's putting up vegetables to, to dry, hanging onions from the ceiling, which they oftentimes did to dry. We don't know what she was doing, but she was in the house and Gabriel just kind of popped in on her, dropped in and said, hey, Mary, and he said to her, Greetings, favored one. Now, wait a minute. You know, Mary didn't know at this point that she was the favored one. She wasn't a princess. She wasn't wealthy. She didn't live in a palace. She wasn't in the bloodline of King Herod. She wasn't in the bloodline of, 
of Caesar Augustus. She was just an ordinary town girl, small village. All of her family and cousins and friends and, and extended relatives living around her, doing everyday chores, taking care of business. And then he said, you will have a son and you will name him Jesus. And he, he said, Jesus will be great and called the Son of the Most High, and God will give him the throne of David. And then he said, Jesus will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will never end. These are, these are powerful, powerful statements. To, given to somebody that she didn't know Gabriel. Gabriel had not met her before this moment. She was told she would be, she, she was favored of God. She was told that not to be afraid. She was told that she had found favor with God. She had told, been told that she would conceive in her womb and have a son and name him Jesus. I mean, what a shocking thing to give to somebody that's maybe 16 or 17 years of old age. That's about when girls got married in Jesus' day, somewhere around uh, the age where they were able to take care of normal life business. At this moment, Mary was a bit overwhelmed and found herself saying, hey, hold on a minute there, dude. This isn't this, this, this can't be. I'm a virgin. I've never been with a man. I've not had any children. I'm not a married woman. I'm an engaged woman, but I have not been married yet, and I have not been with a man. How can I have a baby? How can I bring a child into this world? How is this, how is this possible? And Gabriel said, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, and for that reason the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God." Wow! What he's talking about here is exactly the same thing that happened in the wilderness with the tabernacle and with the, with the Ark of the Covenant and, and with Moses and the people of Israel. You see, the glory of God came down. The Shekinah glory of God came down on Mary in the same way that it came down on the Ark of the Covenant when it was dedicated, in the same way that it came down on the tabernacle when it was dedicated, in the same way that it filled the temple with so much smoke that the people had to leave when Solomon dedicated the temple of God in Jerusalem. That's the power that came down over Mary, and it overshadowed her. It, it covered her over, literally covered her over and caused her to conceive the Son of God. And he said, Behold, even your relative Elizabeth has conceived a son in her old age, and she who was called barren is now in her sixth month. And so we find out here that Mary and Elizabeth are joined as cousins and that John the Baptist is in Elizabeth's womb and now six months along when, G when Mary became pregnant with Jesus. Literally God came down and his glory covered Mary and as proof Gabriel told Mary that this is going to happen because I say so and it's already happened to Elizabeth who was called barren and was in her old age and now she's pregnant because nothing, nothing is impossible with God. Are you disappointed? Are you troubled by the world around us? Are you, are you finding things more difficult to do, finding it hard to be happy and celebrate Christmas, finding it hard to just decorate and, and fill your house with the warmth of the presence of the Lord? Believe me, nothing is impossible with God. If God can make a Elizabeth pregnant in her old age, and God can make a virgin pregnant in her young age, the power of God 
is transcendent and beyond anything that we can imagine. You see, this is the point at which Isaiah 14, verse 7, that we studied last week, is fulfilled. And the Messiah, now 700 years after Isaiah said this, 700 years later, Jesus is conceived in Mary. Don't miss Mary's response in this. Mary looked at Gabriel and said, Behold, the bond slave of the Lord, and may it be done to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. What? Wait a minute. He is going to use her body out of wedlock to produce a child who is called the Son of God. And she is a poor peasant girl living in a village, of, a small village of family members. And she is going to go through scorn and ridicule and all kinds of difficulty. And she just simply says, I'm your bond slave. I'm your servant, God. Do to me as you have said. Do to me as you have said. Can, can we say that to God? Whatever happens in our world out there, whatever difficulty comes, whatever riots happen, whatever violence takes place, can we look at God and say, it's okay. I'm your bond slave. It's okay. Do to me according to your will. What about you? Are you ready to totally surrender yourself to the God of all creation and pay an ultimate price as, as did Mary? As did Daniel? Are you ready to say, God, I want your kingdom in my life. I want to worship you and I want to serve you. And yes, I celebrate, I celebrate the birth of Jesus and I worship him because this day, this day is the most important of all days. You know, tomorrow morning is actually uh, Sinterklaas Day in Dutch, uh, St. Nicholas Day. It's the day on which we recognize the individual from which Santa Claus has been invented. And that man, that man went around feeding and clothing the children, caring for them, loving them. And that's how he got his name. That's how he became St. Nicholas. He was Nicholas, a rich man who spent all of his wealth just simply feeding and caring for children who were in need, buying slaves in a slave market, feeding people who needed to be fed, caring for children all over the earth. That anybody that needed help, Nicholas was there to help. Sacrificing of himself in the same way that Mary did because he saw himself as a bond slave, as a servant of God. I invite you today to become a servant of Jesus and to become a servant of Jesus in a way where you're willing to pay any price to see his glory come down and his, and his power fill the hearts of individuals everywhere. Let's pray. God of all grace and comfort, we ask your presence. We ask the power of your spirit upon us. Help us, Lord, to commit ourselves to you, to fill our hearts with joy and transformation the birth of Jesus is a wonderful, spectacular event that brings us our salvation and fills us with confidence for the future. Help us, Lord, in all the difficulties that we face right now. Help us to see your grace and your glory. And yeah, Lord, bring Gabriel down. May we be terrified of his, of his holy presence and turn to you in grace and glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for being with us tonight.